Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webcast, Go from Records Management to Information Governance, How to Implement an Effective Strategy. We're very excited to have all of you on board. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us. My name is Anne-Marie Cochia, Director of Marketing at Canon Business Process Services, and I'll be your moderator for today's webcast. Before we get started, I do have a few quick housekeeping notes. To eliminate background noise, all participants have been muted. You will only be able to hear our presenter speak. If you'd like to ask us a question, you may do so at any time by clicking on the chat functionality on the right side of your screen on the WebEx dashboard. Type your question, click send, and we'll try to address your question before the end of the program. Because we only have a limited time, we do apologize in advance if we are unable to address your question online. We'll be sure to follow up on any unanswered questions after the webcast. Lastly, we will be sharing an archived version of today's program, and uh, as soon as the program is complete, we'll be sending out that correspondence. As part of our webcast series on going from records management to information governance, Today we're talking about strategy implementation. In particular, we will first discuss why information governance is necessary, the high-level framework for a well-run program, then we're going to go into the implementation, and then analytics and reporting. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our esteemed panelists for today. Melissa Carlis has over 16 years of experience helping companies develop an information management strategy and program that meets business objectives and minimizes risk. Melissa has written a number of articles and is a frequent speaker at industry events such as ARMA and ALA. Melissa, we're so glad to have you on board today. We thank you for carving out this time to share your expertise. Thank you and good morning and good afternoon to everyone. As part of our information governance webinar series, many of these slides at the very beginning are going to be repetitive for those that have attended in the past, but we feel that it's important to review them and it's important for those that are new to the webcast for us to at least introduce the topic. So at Canon, we believe that records management encompasses this wheel. And obviously we're focusing on information governance today, but we must point out or we must emphasize that records is the foundation for any good information governance program. We also include business process imaging in that. And what we mean by business process imaging is it's not simply scanning paper, converting it to digital, but it's understanding the taxonomy. It's understanding the correct repository, putting security measurements around the access and who should have read only or edit controls placed. So when we work with our clients in setting up imaging opportunities, we do a deep dive study with a records management background to it. Information governance is tied directly into e-discovery, where in the past it was, discovery was based solely on the attorneys. We now look to records managers to know what data should be identified, where the data is housed, and what's appropriate to share with outside counsel and opposing counsel. Lit support ties into our records management programs because it obviously supports the discovery process. We tie in something called business process outsourcing, which is looking very deeply into the workflow and the processes of applications, data mapping, any touch points of how that information flows throughout the company and the various technology that's used and the end users that might have access to it so that we can put records management control around that. And today's focus, business process assessment. Throughout this webinar series, we have talked a lot about this assessment, which we have shortened to BPA. And it's extremely important that a BPA is conducted before any information governance programs can be created, built, implemented, and audited. After many of our webinars, we've been asked why information governance? So we thought we would give some structure or some uh, statistical support to the efforts that many people on this call 
are endeavoring to make. So as you can see, Forrester Research, a well-respected organization, has noted that 53% of IT and legal professionals are expecting to have an information governance program in place within the next two years. And that's a dramatic increase from last year, which 25% who have one today, and 18% who had one two years ago. This is something that's very important to companies. It has a wide reaching impact on how we do business. So we just wanna emphasize that this is not something that just Canon is interested in or you're working in a very siloed environment. This is something that all global companies and are reaching out to do today. Thank you, Melissa. That brings us to our first poll question. We'd very much like to hear from our audience. Is your organization planning to implement an information governance program? Yes, within 12 months. Yes, but no timeline. The implementation is underway. We are already in implementing, or we already have, or no. So we'd like for you to just take a moment, and we'd love to hear from you. If you could record your response on the right side of your screen. And we'll just take a few seconds. I see that more folks are responding, so let's just take a moment. Okay, I'm seeing, uh, let's see, 13% within 12 months. I'm seeing the numbers changing, 29%, yes, but no timeline. Implementation underway, 8% and 17% we already have. So Melissa, what do you think about that yes but no timeline at 31%? I'm not surprised to that outcome. Information governance is a hot topic. Many people and many companies are interested in transitioning away from their current practices. However, they're struggling as to where to start, if they have the budget, what resources are entailed, and who actually is educated enough to do this within their company. So no, I'm not surprised at that at all, but I am, I am glad to hear that there is an interest in, in implementing one. So I mentioned a little earlier that after many of our webinar series, we're, we're receiving many questions that ask, why initiate or participate in a process that can be so lengthy, it's expensive, if you Google or do any research on information governance, you'll receive a plethora of answers on what information governance could mean. Uh, you may have attended the Canon series and saying, okay, I understand their viewpoint, but I just don't understand why I should be doing this, why this should be important to my company, or even how I get the, the interest of a champion, the executive sponsor, so that I have the budget and the resources made available to me. I want to emphasize that information governance, similar to records management, is very industry specific, but it's also based on your company's culture and their operational needs. So similar to a retention schedule, it's there for guidance, but you also have to take into account how you operate as a company, what kind of clients you have, are you global, are you national, or are you just regional? There are many things that go into why you should have a good records management program and information governance. But we did list here some very high level examples of why you should have that. Compliance with laws and regulations, with internal policies. It's great to have a policy, but if you have no way of analyzing that it's being followed, you have no control over the data and how it's being shared, you have no idea if there's numerous version controls, then you don't know if you're compliant with your own policies. As I mentioned earlier, discovery costs are very expensive. If you're looking to your internal records manager instead to control some of that, maybe it's the identification of the appropriate information, it could even be part of the culling and reviewing to a certain point, you're saving your company an incredible amount of time. You need to know that you're adherent to the regulations that seem to be ever changing and information governance, if you have a platform in place, will help you adapt what you have in place so that you can easily transition to a different level. Investigations and security, very important. Many of our clients are internal 
and externally audited or investigated for potentially bad behavior. There may have been a product that has to be pulled from the market. So if you need to get your hands on that data and it has to be the right version to show that your company did behave properly, that the research was done in, a, in the proper manner, you wanna be able to locate that information. You wanna have the right information, obviously. So you need that information governance in, in effect. Now, so today's challenges, there is a large paper footprint. Many people say, no, we work completely electronic, but the reality of it is people are still printing, people are still receiving paper, and there is a lot of off-site storage out there. So that is something that you need to address. Uncontrolled systems and data, Many IT firms, or excuse me, departments over the years have been told, as per department, let's get this application. They need the bells and whistles to do their job to function properly, but there's no linking of the repositories or the way the information flows. So you have a variety of type of versions. You have data that may be conflicting, and there's no understanding of where the final version should be kept and in what repository. You also have the uncontrolled user data as we supply our employees with uh, PDAs. We let them email to their home email addresses as they're taking their laptops, they're using USBs, they're saving to their private share or their share drives, their private drives, et cetera. We're creating uh, an environment of chaos in which we cannot control the most important asset of the company, which is the information. And therefore, with all of this happening, you have no legal readiness. So as a reminder, records management, 10 years ago, what was that? We've always used the basic definition provided by ARMA, that it is the creation, receipt, maintenance, use, disposition of the life cycle of records. However, it was based mostly on paper. We had very limited access to electronic data. It was mostly confined to the document management system. We only dealt with information that was declared record of business activity and transaction. So if it was copies or redlining or information that was considered too private, we had no access to it. We only had the declared version, and that could have been paper, or even in the DMS, and that's all we saw. And very limited exposure to IT, usually risk compliance and audit divisions didn't even exist. So where have we evolved? Where are we today? We like to call it records management plus here at Canon, and the reason being, you'll see that the same definition applies we are still concerned with that creation to disposition control. It, it doesn't change, and that's the foundation of a good information governance program. But what has changed is that we're now in charge of metadata. It goes way beyond just having access to the electronic information. Many of the auditors, many of the attorneys are interested in the metadata behind the record or even the copy or even the casual document because that's what's important. That's what is, that shows if the client acted in good faith. We're also interested more in the whole in enterprise storage. So as all the platforms grow and the server sizes grow, anything that's implemented, the records manager should be heavily involved in the content across all of them. We should be in discussions about the security classifications, any privacy, privacy attributes that the knowledge managers, that the IT departments are deciding. These are records managers that are evolving into information governance managers, and they are very well trained in knowing what aspects are important. They should be in heavily involved in what data is acceptable to house in the repositories, how they should be managed, who touches them, what the security levels are, et cetera. The C-level needs to be paying attention to this. Once again, security breaches, issues with privacy, product issues, intellectual property, that's all very important to the C-level, but it shouldn't be made decision, any decision should not be made without the records manager. 
I've already addressed the e-discovery portion of this where there's a direct link. And if there isn't, then that needs to happen immediately. And then what wraps all of this up is dashboard reporting with analytics. So as we go throughout this process, we need to understand where we started, how we are growing in efficiency, how are we getting better, if there are setbacks, how we address them and move forward. So we need to do auditing and reporting of the transition from the records management to information governance. So this wheel here is the information governance reference model. This is provided by IGRM, and this is something that if you are engaging with upper management or needing executive sponsorship or just bringing other groups into the fold that you need a task force to start this transition, this is a really good model for you to use. But you'll notice that it matches very closely to what Canon's definition is. If you look at the inner circle, I've just described that that's ARMA's basic definition of what records management should be. We talked about the importance of policies and procedures. All of this should be transparent and integrated. We talked about records management has grown into information governance in that it's enterprise-wide, it's working hand-in-hand -hand with IT, it's working with legal so that discovery can happen, None of this can happen if you don't start with that records management platform, if you don't have the policies and the processes built around it, and then the benefits, the unified governance is that your business will be more profitable because you can have action that's definable and efficient because you have access to that information that's correct. You know that you have your privacy and security built in so your risks are diminished, if not eliminated. Your IT efficiency, when there's more and more requests for server space and more applications, instead they know that there's an information governance process in place that they can deny those requests or they can utilize current repositories to say, why do you need that in the first place? Let's build on what we have. And legal risk, once again, responding to subpoenas, working with external attorneys to find that information. So you'll see at the bottom the duty, the value, and the asset. So this is a very good model for you to base the beginning of your information governance program. So ARMA and AIM came together and did a survey report in 2014, and we just we just included this in the, today's presentation to once again not only give you Canon's perspective on what we believe is best for IG and how to get started and how to implement, but these are some takeaways that you can utilize when once again you're engaging your colleagues, you're getting executive sponsorship, and you're building out your, your budget to understand what you need. So electronically stored information is a very important part of information governance. and you cannot do that without an effective RIM program. The first statistic here is 87% overall, 95% of the large organizations already have that RIM program because they recognize they can't move forward without the RIM, which is records and information management. Information governance is increasingly recognized as imperative for compliance and risk mitigation. By industry, risk is defined very differently. If you talk to a financial firm versus a law firm, you're going to get different definitions of what they consider risk. So we don't really spend a lot of time on that phrase because that's very high level. Instead, when we go through what entails the BPA, we'll say this is how you identify risk for your individual company. And then the legal whole processes, very commonplace, but as we've mentioned in the past, Legal holds are thought of, put everything on hold, don't touch the, the current data, don't edit it, don't share it, and don't touch it for any reason. That's not really very realistic, and the worst part of it is it's based on end user or employee behavior, which you cannot monitor. If you're a company of 400 people or 40,000 people, you have no idea how those people are interacting with 
data that you have told them are on hold. So as you build your information governance program, you will build into your technology plus your training for change management of behavior of corporate employees of how they will deal with the legal hold because you will very well define what needs to be on hold. You may be even able to put it in an archived area using a module or a locked room, depending if it's electronic or physical. And you build that process so that you more effectively can place legal holds. So let's review the framework and launch into our various phases. We are talking about phases four and five today, but as a quick recap for those that did not attend in the past, we talked about the beginning of any information governance transition that we need a business process assessment. That is a very deep dive analysis of where your firm currently is in managing its data. Not necessarily information or even declared records. It has to encompass all data. How is it ingested? Where does it go? What are the various touch points? How is it managed? And then how is it ultimately dispositioned? So is it destroyed? Is it left alone? Never, no one ever does anything with it. Do people randomly destroy? Do they go on backup tapes or do they go out to the cloud? You as a records manager or someone that's supporting this needs to know all of this. There has to be intense data mapping and an understanding of everything I just described. You also though have to understand the culture of each of the departments and of the overall company. You have to understand their strategies and needs because you cannot come back with suggestions that are disruptive in the way that people do business. Yes, phase four is a disruption because it's implementation and it's change management, but you also want to keep the needs that people put things in place because of a lack of support or they weren't getting what they want. We always tend to think of it as sloppy behavior, but it's not always the case. And as you go through this BPA process, you're getting sponsorship from the executives. You're bringing in IT, risk, compliance, finance, people like your CEO. Phase two is the resulting report. And this is where a very detailed report is issued that says, here's your current scenario. Here are our strengths and weaknesses. Here are potential gaps. And here are our overall recommendations to either strengthen the strengths or to overcome those gaps or even acknowledge that you have them and say, this is something we're not going to address. And included in all of that is repositories, workflows, security, privacy, and this is where you need your records management. This is why you can't leave this simply up to legal or IT because records should be a group of people or at least one person that's educated in all of the regulations. They should be understanding where ARMA is leading us these days and AIM and becoming an information governance professional, bringing that aspect that says, Yes, there's a regulation that mandates we act in a certain way, but here's an exception to that, and I'm going to tell you why, what's best for the company. It's not a, it's not a very black and white thing. The solution report will also include defined roles. So who's going to lead this? Who's going to be the champion? What is the task force? Because we don't want to get bogged down in committees, but we also need a lot of support for this because it's not going to happen without it. And then we're going to offer the policies, the standards, and some procedure recommendations so that task force or that sponsor can pick and choose what makes sense for the company, why you suggested them, what funding you get in response, and what resources you have. Our last series that we had, we talked about planning for change. This is where you take a step back and say, based on the BPA, based on the report, and the resources and the funding I now have, I need to get ready for this. And this is simply, maybe I need education. Maybe I'm not up to speed. Maybe I need to get my task force educated. Do I have the project management tools that I need to have in place to get me where I need to go? Is everybody on board with me? Do I need to do more selling of this and marketing of this? So I need to go to the various divisions to make sure that they're buying in. Do I need to even offer initial training 
that says, this is what's going to be happening in a few months. Get prepared. These are some checklists that I'm going to share with you so that these, when you see us coming to your division or when you get emails, you understand that this is good, the good, excuse me, good for the company. So today, once again, we're going to focus on phases four and five, which are the implementation and the analytics, the analytics behind it. So as a reminder, this is a slide we've seen numerous times. That transactional management is what we're talking about in phases one and two and three. If you don't understand how the data is received, what data is housed and how it's managed, you can't create a strategy. The strategy will have no relevance. So once you become highly educated through that BPA process, you will then start to look at how the business functions and you're going to tie in or link what you know about current scenario with how the company operates, its end goals, and then you're creating your strategy for four and five. You may at this point, can we go back? We may at this point have a possible ROI. A lot of financial personnel or client contacts that we have say, okay, well, what savings am I gonna have? Based on what I've explained to you, you, there's usually not an ROI. It's more about operating properly. It's about having access to your information timely. All of the ideas and ideology that surround records management. So you may be able to talk about soft costs, but you don't have the hard cost savings. So you as the records manager or someone that's interested in this, you have to acknowledge that. You have to be upfront that ROA may not be in existence, but it's addressing the pain points. It's pointing them out and it's legitimizing that there are these issues and that you, we know what they are and we know what we have to do to overcome them. It's supplying suggestions for solutions and it's getting champion buy-in. So be very careful when talking about ROI and cost savings when it comes to this topic. Thank you, Melissa. And that brings us to our second poll question. Once again, we very much want to hear from our audience. And this time, the question is, which functional area at your company or, for, or firm would lead or currently leads an information governance program? Would you say it's your legal department, compliance, records, IT, procurement, operations, or is it another department within your company? And we'll just take a few seconds for you to record your response on the right. And we thank you for the folks that are participating. Okay, we see some uh, respondents here. Okay, just wait a few more seconds. So Melissa, what we're seeing so far is 7% legal, 12% compliance, 20% the records department, 15% IT, and then procurement zero, operations three, and other 5%. So there, it looks like our records, the records department is leading the effort for the most part. That's, that's great to hear. Obviously everyone li listed here needs to be part of the initiative, but it's great to hear that 20% would would think that records would lead that and that you have confidence in your records department to do so. So that's great. All right, so we're gonna launch into phases four and five. And once again, we're going to emphasize that the business process assessment is the place where we start this process. It's now where we're getting our hands dirty and this is the most difficult part because you have to deliver on all of the suggestions and recommendations that you provided, yet it may be a very time consuming process and you may be distracted with other things throughout this, this, this project. But it is a long term solution. It is something that usually takes years to accomplish. We've had some clients that really threw the resources at it and had task and, and committees assigned so that it didn't take as long. Um, but once again, this is where the, the rubber hits the road and, and this is the most difficult part. 
We are transforming data to digital information. And what that simply means is, is that as you identify the data that exists, the incoming, the outgoing, the, the data that's in place, you're trying to convert it into information. You're, you're defining what your company needs to have to function as a business. You're training your end users on their behavior of what should be saved, what shouldn't be saved, what's acceptable in their email strategy, et cetera. So we didn't necessarily say that data converts to records. We just said that we understand that sometimes information itself has value on a trans, transient basis that may not be declared record at a letter, later time. But those are all the definitions that your records manager will put into place. They'll work with IT and legal and compliance and say this repository can handle, can hold these business activities, similar to your accounting department. As they're building their invoicing or their you know, end of year reporting, not all of that needs to be saved, but they want it for access or retrieval or review, maybe for a year or two. We don't declare it as records, we don't move it, we don't put it on legal hold usually, we just leave it in the repository, but that's something that the records manager has de decided with the CFO and with the IT department, and that's where it stays and that's okay that it does. They don't become, certain amounts of that information does not become records, but it's managed in a way that it's effective, so it goes from data to digital. Controls on how data is ingested, I think this is the biggest uh, pain point for a lot of companies. They're just getting overwhelmed with incredible amounts of information on a daily basis. So how do they even get a hold of that? How do they place value on, on data to say that it is information? What we've done is actually do the reverse. What we've worked with our clients is analyze current data and define it as valuable or rot. And as many of you know, rot means redundant, obsolete, or trivial. And we run analytics beyond that to say, we've noticed that your version control, well, there is no version control. We've noticed that many things are saved that are inadequate naming conventions. We've noticed that the same data is housed in seven different repositories. So we do a lot of analytics on the rot, go back to the departments, work with them on how to clean it up so that it doesn't accumulate again, build the technology or you know use the share drives if that's what your particular division uses in a way that someone controls it, that there's a lead in place that says, this is how we have to manage our, our data. We then use the parameters that we've created for the ROT data and we start to look at the bigger picture. When it's incoming, who controls it? You know, we talk about digital intake centers. It could be based on paper coming in and it's uh, digitized and it's placed in a repository by a very centralized group of people that apply a taxonomy, know based on the doc type where it has to go so various people can view it or read only or touch it or check it in or check it out. But we also have digital intake centers where they're actually receiving the electronic information and doing the same function so that at least the ROT data does not accumulate again at the rapid rate it, ha it is currently. So it's all about def defining that information, is it a record, is it simply information, where it should be housed, and how can we better control it. Creating hold areas, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, that a lot of technology have archive modules where you can temporarily move that data into that archive. You can use a locked room for it, but it puts it in a review only situation and it's very defined so that, once again, you're not expecting your end users or your employees to actually try to limit their usage of that data. You're taking it away from them. You're, you're putting it into the hands of the records manager. And monitoring and enforcing conformance with policy standards and architecture. That goes directly, that ties directly into phase five, the analytics. You have to build reporting at this stage. You have to have those uh, analytics behind what you're doing. Are you becoming more efficient? Are you, are, is your raw data decreasing? Is the service space 
decreasing, or if it is increasing, why are the repositories possibly disappearing? It really depends on what the goals are for your information governance program, but you should have it in measurable uh, steps. And obviously, the outcomes of the implementation. The maturity model ranking is issued through ARMA, and it's a really good tool that we use at Canon because it's one through five, it's very well defined, it's, it helps you be creative in deciding the next steps that you want to do in your BPA process, which is stage one, and you can use it to say, we're at a level one or a level two, we want to get to level four, and these are the reasons why. So as you are monitoring and enforcing your conformance, hopefully your maturity model ranking is increasing. That's not something that happens very quickly, but on an annual basis, you should utilize it. And obviously, your steps are always towards the future state and going from records management to information governance. So we've used this as a sample implementation roadmap for, for phase four. This may have no relevance to your current scenario, it's just examples. So as you see in our stage one, we obviously have our BPA, which we discussed. We have our next steps. In phase two, we've worked with our clients in identifying, do you have the right records manager in place? And possibly you do. You have a records manager that, that simply needs more education. There are numerous accreditations to do that. There's a lot of training, there are websites, there are vendors like Canon that are happy to partner with you in making sure that that manager is able to uh, be prepared for this transition. We do a spring clean tasks, and that goes back to the redundant, obsolete, and trivial data. Let's get you cleaned up before you try to tackle everything. We can take it in steps. We'll build the um, IG program based on piloting. Let's take one division, let's work this out, and see if it works. And unstructured data, that once again is the biggest issue our clients have, and so going through there and at least reducing the amount of data and putting a taxonomy on what you do have and defining what data is information or what information is records will give you that solid foundation. Activating the archive module, once again, that is something I described previously. You can use that for your holds, but you can also, that's where your vital records are stored. That's where IT needs, knows that they need to go immediately when your systems go down or if there's a disaster, you have a call center or you know that you have a customer service, service level agreement with some of your clients that you will respond within so many minutes or so many hours. You need to identify that information and where it should go so that your IT is working in a very concentrated effort to get your company up and running again. Obviously, back up to hot and cold sites. We work with many clients in, in uh, understanding what that entails and what should be stored there, and redundancy. We also work in records consolidation. That's how many systems do you really have and why do you have them and, and what, what needs do they serve so that if you are consolidating, you're not ignoring, as I mentioned earlier, the operational or the cultural need of your company and your clients. Culling data, merging the data. The goal for us with a lot of our clients is to try to get to a single repository. That may not be possible, but at least let's go from 30 repositories to maybe 50%. Let's have some goal in mind that makes it easier for us to control the data going forward. We talked about the digital intake center. These are just some examples of how we've handled incoming hard copy, how we've handled incoming digital information, scanning on demand as those boxes come from offsite storage. They are there, they're in existence, especially for, the, for people that are in attendance on this have companies that are more than 10 or 15 years old. It's a reality, so what do we do? Well, we analyze how many times this particular document has been pulled back. We go to the division, let's get it digitized and let's get rid of the paper so that it's feeding into the system because it's obviously part, very important part of how this one particular division operates. ECM advancement, this is where you're getting into your digitally born documents. 
you know, as you enable your, your employees to work faster and have their information faster, are you really enabling them to work smarter? Are you enforcing that whatever data they have out there is being forced into either a repository or that they know that what they have on the PDAs are simply copies and therefore they will be wiped at a certain point? It, it, it runs again and goes back to what works best for you operationally and culturally. We put down here litigation support as a service. That may not be relevant to you, but it's just an example of what we've built as part of an IG process because as some of our clients are heavily regulated or they have their litigation prone because of the particular product that they produce, we built the litigation support on, on site under the management of the records department. Auditing, we have our checklist, report cards, resulting action items because once again, we want to keep ourselves in check. We want to keep our eyes on the future, not get discouraged when we come across setbacks. And we're going to go over a little bit of what we mean by report cards. But checklists are things that you issue to various divisions. You can only audit so many times. And then you have to hand it off to the various divisions. And you have to put in policies and procedures that they perform these audits themselves so many times a year, how they audit it, how do they get the responses back to you so that as you're reporting into the champions or the task force that the information is standardized and that we have a true understanding of where we are as a company. And then discovery services on demand, not going to go over that. That's simply, uh, that's similar to the litigation support as a service. This is a reminder that as we talk about technology and data, that we always want to go back to our records management roots, that you need to have a policy in place, you need to have a current, functioning, applied, implemented schedule, you need to have very well-defined and documented standards, you need to have your employees trained on those standards and the procedures. Okay, it's great to have a standard, it's great to have a schedule, but how do I enforce them as the average employee? And then you need to tell them specific instructions on how to perform those procedures. And you'll see the most important part of it, it's across your enterprise. Even if you're a global company and you have to worry about different regulations and laws and mandates from the government or courts, you still can start with the basics and the standardization across the enterprise, and then your guidelines or your procedures may differentiate per, per country. Okay. So this is, this is the fun phase where you are measuring and demonstrating the success of your transformation. It's the one that keeps you engaged, the task force engaged, it's the reporting that goes out to employees that said we're making progress, this, is, this has a mission statement to it, there's a reason we're doing it, but also that there's less of a chance for a uh, breach, that your personal information is safe, all of the things that we read about on a daily basis, you're telling, you're communicating out to the employees that these are the efforts that you as a company are making to ensure that your company's name is not going to be in tomorrow's news. So we want to collect metrics. We want to measure both the direct actions and the derived measures. We want to analyze the results. And obviously, we're going to show you what we mean by that. We also want to report on not only our own achievements, but what's going out in the industry for your, your company. So once again, maybe you're a law firm, maybe you are an insurance company. What's going on with other companies in your industry? What's going on, what's happening in information governance itself? What are the trends? Are we keeping up with them? This isn't something that you do an initial analysis and four years later, you're still at the same spot. This is an ever changing, environment, your technology is training, you're getting new employees, outgoing employees, getting new ways to hack into your firewalls, et cetera. Everything's changing. So whomever is leading this initiative needs to keep current with the industry and include that in the reporting back to the sponsor and the executive committee. And obviously the outcomes for all of this is to show improvement, 
to justify that the initial investment and the continued investment is worth the company's time, the employees that are involved, and obviously the money being spent. I mentioned cost savings. At this point, you might start to see them. You know, maybe it's a year, maybe it's five years, maybe it's 10 years, but it's more about the risk reduction that is important to your company. So here's an example of what we utilize for um, reporting. These are dashboards, and no disrespect for the C-level, they usually don't like to see the numbers behind it. They want to see the pie charts or the dashboard or even the graphs that show, okay, the paper footprint, this is what we looked like in year one, this is what we look like at the end of year one. The user data has decreased as the system data has increased because we're putting all that, we're cleaning out the shared drives, the personal drives, and we're now culling it and putting it into systems that everyone can access and read or have limited access based on security needs. We're getting better at our legal readiness. You could have that audit readiness depending on your company. Here are the metrics, the reporting about the finances, how much did all of this cost, and legal matters. You know, how were we able to respond, et cetera. And you can see we started out with an F. We, were, we got an overall 50% score. There's absolutely no shame in being honest. It's not a bad reflection because you're starting this process to get better. So you will have a 50% score for possibly the first six months, but you're tracking and you're showing a slight increase. Maybe you're now at 51%, 52%, and then you're going to have leaps in this percentage of completion and improvement. And that's okay because, once again, you're identifying the strengths and the weaknesses in the beginning business process assessment. So the executive board, the sponsor is well aware of what the issues are. He or she just wants to see that this grade is get going, that this grade is improving. So I know we're running out of time, so I want to quickly go through some of the dashboard uh, headers or, or buckets, if you will, that are involved in this analysis. You have your paper, you know, everything at the beginning of these dashboards starts with the BPA. So you've got your inventory, your analysis. You are touching on the retention schedule. You know, how well is it applied? Does anybody even know about it? How, how are they trained? There's a lot of granular detail that is behind each one of these high-level buckets. And then the audit plans, you know, where are we with that? Vendors, how do we interact with them? You see our score is a little bit better, but obviously 71% is not acceptable. Go to the next one, which is the systems data. This is where I told, where I mentioned earlier where we are interacting with IT very, very closely. And we're talking about the, what, what do the systems look like today? What, what data is out there? How is it retained? Um, does, does the IT even have any idea about retention schedules? Have they been trained on what records management is and the importance of it? And the audit plan, et cetera. Once again, these are just examples. We mentioned a little bit earlier about legal readiness. You could have this as audit readiness or anything else readiness. And we're not going to go through these because they're basically the same high-level buckets, but you want to continually improve. And some, some of these may stay at 0% for a while, but as long as you're showing improvement in other areas. Also impor important in your reporting and your analytics is risk matrix. Now, when I say risks, I don't necessarily mean that external risk like disaster recovery or business continuity, hurricanes, go, your system's going down. These are risks that are obstacles for the records manager or whomever's leading this initiative may encounter. And this is just a snapshot. We actually use an Excel spreadsheet to do the risk matrix identification because it's a very intense process that says, these are all the tasks per division or per bucket that we're doing, and these are the obstacles that we either address, ignore, downgrade, and they may be simply that so-and-so is not showing up to the meetings, that we don't have the applicable hardware, that the resources have dried up, and the resources could be just 
you lost a, an employee. It could be that the CEO is no longer being cooperative. It could be a variety of things. So we don't want to think big picture risk here. We want to get very granular on this that says, how did we address each one of these risks, whatever they may be, but they're very internal and there are things that will impede progress. So the next steps for this is I want to remind you that the business process assessment should be done annually. Now, not to the full extent that it was done initially, but it shouldn't have to be. It can simply be taking certain sections, sending a checklist to the, the, the divisions and saying, is this still the case? Is what we had as a current snapshot and what we identified as the gaps and weaknesses or the strengths still the same? And this is the improvements that we identified as working on it together as a team. Has these changed dramatically? And so you want to do an assessment annually so that you have consistent goals and objectives throughout this process, that your observations are somewhat the same or if they've changed why and how your program needs to adjust those changes. You need to understand how the workflow processes and the technology may have to be tweaked to uh, address that assessment and then keep your next, step, next steps flowing so that you currently are updating yourself, your task force, your committees, and your sponsor on what has to happen next through your analytics and through your risk matrix. So this is just a wrap-up slide. We've already gone through this, but we want to encourage you that you follow this path. It has worked for Canon on numerous occasions. We want to encourage you that if you need external help that you reach out for it. We've mentioned that Canon is a vendor that provides outsourcing and we do provide consulting based on a national group of subject matter experts that can help you in any of these phases or help you through the entire life cycle of going from records management to information governance. Thank you, Melissa. And that concludes today's program. We hope our audience has found significant insights in today's session. If you have any questions for Melissa or would like to learn more about how Canon Business Process Services is helping other companies develop and implement an information governance program, please contact us directly at the email address on your